Hello, and welcome to the Vlogging Pod. Tonight, we are joined by Samantha Renee. <laughs> welcome to the room, Samantha. How are you this evening? Oops, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've blocked you. I did the mic and then forgot to undo you. I'm sorry. My apologies. How are you this evening? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I did it so that um, when I did my intro and then I forgot to unmute you. I'm uh, my apologies. Ah, <laughs> uh, you know I never promise perfection on this show. <laughs> I mean, so go ahead. No, I mean, I mean, my life is far from perfect. Anything I do is probably the furthest thing from. Oh, I know. You know, um, I was going to bring this up just a little bit for, but since we're talking about our lives in general, um, I'm going to skip ahead to one of my questions here. So I, you know, as I was looking at you and you, you're also a full-time author, but you also have jo other jobs on the side, like most of us do. But I was noticing one of your jobs used to be working at Kroger's, right? <laughs> Yes, uh, it's been a few years, but I did work there for a while. So did I. <laughs> oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, my gosh. I was looking at that, and I was like, oh, my gosh. And, in fact, I mean, I know you were in Michigan, and now you're a Texan. Um, but I was thinking, oh, my gosh, she reminds me of someone because – you are a gamer as well. And I was like, oh my gosh, this could be a replica of someone I worked with. And your <laughs> your similarity, I know your similarities are so much like her. And I was like, oh my gosh, because she had she liked writing as well. And we shared that in common. So it was kind of interesting to actually see that. Right. Yeah, no, I, I worked at Kroger for a few years. I was a cashier and then got sort of promoted, I guess, to self-checkout, which means you're responsible oh. for more than just one register. You're responsible for like six or ten. Oh, yeah. See, I worked at a marketplace and we did... Um... We did, uh, I did that first, the clothing section when I first got started, when it, because our, the store where I was at, um, had first got, um, hold on, my camera keeps messing around here. There we go. Um, I've got one of those, uh, action things on my camera. We're just now trying it out and it is all over this room. <laughs> 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 it's like it's possessed in here. Um, but anyway, so. I did the apparel section and the interesting thing about it was I, I switched to, um, I did that for a little while and then I switched to, um, oh, for goodness sakes, I can't remember what it's called. Um, oh, heavens to Betsy, I can't remember what it's called, but you know, when you have people, you pick up your groceries. I was that person that would go around in those big crates and stuff and get your groceries. That's what I ended up doing before I quit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, oh my gosh. I can't remember the name of it either. It's been a minute. <laughs> I know, right? It's like putting yourself on the spot. You're like, crap, I should have wrote this down. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, as I mentioned, uh, you are a current Texan, but you were born in Michigan and there is something else we have in common. I'm not Michigan, but I could have been your neighbor in Ohio. <laughs> oh, dear God. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Too close for comfort, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I I don't claim Texas. Uh, I mean, I, I live here, but I don't claim it. Michigan will always be home. Oh, okay. All right. Well, you know, that's not bad either. I mean, home is actually where you where you put your hat at, you know, because that's what I always tell my mom. It's like, you know, you can live here, you live there, but home is where family is or where the urge takes you. Right. <laughs> so, <clears throat> excuse me. So as you were saying, like you're from Michigan and you moved to Texas, do you, can you t elaborate why the move? Well, um, so, I mean, this, this all started 11 years ago. Um, the original move out of Michigan um, was actually to a different part of Texas, 
because uh, my dad works for General Motors and uh, he was invited to come help start off uh, one of the plants uh, down in the DFW area. Um, and we spent a few years there, but then we actually moved to uh, Tennessee. And oh. I spent about five years there before I moved back to Texas, but a completely different area because um, I had to get out of my parents' house. I mean, it, it was past time. I was in my late twenties um, and my I had two friends living here. One's lived in this area all her life. So, um, I mean, the, the three of us were able to get an apartment and then, you know, just never looked back. But I'm also kind of stuck here now. So because I can't oh. afford to move, move out. Oh, man. Well, I kind of feel you there. I mean, I have we have been in our own fair share of places. You're like, oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> what was right? it? <laughs> yeah, I understand that. So as I was saying, as I usually do, I like to do research on my guests. And as I was doing that, I was looking through your feed and uh, you happen to have for something on for National Pet Day. So where's that tabby at? And give me the name. <laughs> uh, sushi is uh, out in another part of the house uh somewhere um because he's been very mouthy today so it's like okay you need to leave because i gotta do a thing <laughs> i feel you on that we've got our fair share of a few kitties around here not in my uh sound booth i've got a dog at my feet but we got like four dogs and quite a few kitty cats going around so i feel that we have uh four dogs as well um but they are, one of them is one of my roommates and the other three are the others. I mean, uh, I mean, yeah, we could claim all of them, but you know, on paper, they're, they're not mine. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they all become family when they're under one roof at one point or another. Yeah. At least that's how I'd be. I'd be like, nope, it's mine now, guys. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> well, that's kind of what happened with the cat. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> an adoption from a roommate? Pretty much. Mm. I feel you there. I feel you there. I've had quite a few that have popped over here and have just never left. <laughs> <laughs> and the next, we have a few in, inside and a few outside kitty cats. And trust me, I fully understand what you're saying. So right. when I looked at your, when I looked at your cover, um, I notice that also you have, let's see, now as we talk about careers and you have an arts degree, am I correct on that? Um, I mean, I have a associates in the arts, um, mm -hmm. but I mean, th that's it. I mean, that, that was my entire qualification to, I guess, writing, although I guess you don't really need anything to write a book. You just, you know, you have the will to do it and you do it. Right. Well, having the having a, a degree in arts is actually pretty awesome, especially when I'm going to ask you about your cover. Tell me about the inspiration about that. And for those who don't know, it's in the um, bio. We're talking about Council of the Mists. So tell me about the cover. Um, well, so there's, there's technically two of them because there was the original cover and then there was the upgrade, um, mm -hmm. which I mean, it's the same concept, but, um, the new version is more commercially accessible, I guess. Um, but the original cover, which a good friend of mine, uh, actually put a lot of time and work into um, that was what I wanted to like a T, you know, every last detail. Um, I was, you know, trying to think in my head, you know, what could, you know, what should this cover be? And I was like, I keep seeing a chalice full of blood because vampires. And then I am seeing wings somehow. So probably like around the the back of the chalice um, for the Valkyrie. 
and mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, well, Kat, what can you do with this? And you know, she did out a, a sketch and you know, I told her, okay, these are the colors because these colors are um, part of the, the flag of Normandy, which is the home of the vampires in Valkyrie in my book. And mm -hmm. she did it up and I was like, oh my God, that's the cover I saw. <laughs> um, and that, I mean, I was so excited about it. And then six, seven months go by, I'm not doing well with sales and multiple people are telling me it's your cover. And mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to, I wanted to be stubborn and say, no, just keep going. And then I, I finally cracked one day and was like, okay, we're, we're doing this. And I got getcovers.com to clean it up, I guess. Um, I was like, I know you guys can't do like an exact replica because of copyright, but I need this same basic concept and mm -hmm. I need it translated into a more commercially accessible cover. And that's the new cover and that's what people can buy now. Okay. I get that. So when you visually, did you sketch it out yourself or do you just knew mentally, visually in your own head, how you wanted it to portray out on the cover? Yeah, no, I can't draw. So my friend is the one that drew it. Um, but I, I was like, okay, this, th this is the description of what I need. And then she worked her magic. Oh, I gotcha. I gotcha. It, it's amazing as a writer, especially when you're writing the books, um, how you see it. Sometimes, even in my own work, I have a premise of the book, but I always find if I have the cover already done, then I leave it up on one part of my screen. I'm like, okay, this is my inspiration. <laughs> and then I'll start writing the book. And then as the book evolves, I'm like, crap, I've got to change this cover. <laughs> right. Yeah, so I fully understand. So now, like I said, we're talking about the Council of the Mist. Can you tell me a little bit about this book? And from what I understand, this is your first book, correct? Yes, my first book. Okay. okay. Can you tell me a little bit about the storyline? Uh, well, see, that's a little hard because um, there are 12 point of view characters, all first person in my book, and they all have different plot lines. Um, but if I'm going to give you a summary of everything, um, the book takes place on a continent that is hidden within our world. It's hidden in the Pacific Ocean. It's called the Continent of Myths. And um, it is home to all kinds of mythical creatures, uh, vampires, Valkyrie, werewolves, shapeshifters, satyrs, nymphs. Uh, merfolk, sirens, elves, and fairies, and all kinds of other types of creatures um, that you'd find in mythology. And um, the, the jumping off point of the book is a young woman from Michigan <laughs> um, who finds out that she was adopted by her parents and she is the daughter of the original vampire who was just found dead and they had no heir and she is the heir even though she was an mm. illegitimate daughter and mm -hmm. so she is brought to this world that she had no idea existed and she is thrust into this role that she was ill prepared for. Mm, okay. So when you started writing, how did you do your plot line character? Give us an idea of how you started off and how you segment it. Cause you're talking about 12 first persons. I'm just wondering how that played out. Is it go from one chapter to one character or did you do that individually in the chapters? Um, when I started, the book was intended to only be told from Amelia's point of view, who is the, the new queen of the vampires. Um, okay. but as I went on and this, 
this was years because between having to work a full-time job and battling mental health problems and you know, needing other things to distract me, I it took years to get the original manuscript done. Um, but as those years went on, I started writing from other people's point of views. And I'm like, this is the story because there's a lot you're not seeing from Amelia's point of view that I feel like makes a fuller story. So the, the, with the exception of the prologue and chapter three, um, every, um, every chapter is sectioned off by different points of view. Because the way that I view it is, the way that I write is, I write like it's a, you know, I can see it in my head. And I section it off like, kind of like it's a TV show. So you, you're jumping from one scene to the next scene, you know, and then next chapter would be like, oh, commercial break. Okay. Okay. I see what you're saying. Um, so when you were doing your character outlines, did that create it as you were writing the book or after you found out that you were going to switch from multiple characters, did that evolve as well? Um, sort of, I, I got to know some of the characters a little better once I started writing from their point of view, um, where it is in, you know, other circumstances, I might not have even thought twice about some of them. Um, and then it just, it gives you the opportunity to get closer to not only the ones you're writing the point of view from, but you're also getting to know the people that are around them because mm -hmm. i mean if it you were hearing this all from amelia's point of view these would just be static characters in the background that would just be mentioned in passing maybe have one or two lines um if she's in the room with them but i mean you actually get to know some of these people now that you're hearing from people that are closer to them and it's like these people are really interesting <laughs> you know you you get to develop them a little better than you would have and i mean there's there's a lot of them i mean there's a cast of hundreds in my book but i mean i i love them all and it's because i got to write from so many different points of view that i became attached to all of them and right. felt like they they got their due diligence of being more fully developed mm -hmm. so this being your first book and again you said this took over a couple of years to establish and create tell me what you've learned from this as your first book and something that you might want to carry over into your next um i've learned that editing sucks <laughs> welcome to my world <laughs> It, it it is the biggest headache and i i wanted to cry a lot mm. and i said mm. i already wrote the thing don't ask me to go back over it um mm. and i've learned that i need a blurb if i'm going to put this out there because um you got to put something on the back and you got to draw people in and i'm like okay well same thing i already wrote the thing don't ask me to summarize it mm. um but i mean for the the second book i feel like it's a little bit easier maybe um mm -hmm. because the second book is was originally the back half of book one <clears throat> the original manuscript would have been almost 800 pages because the story was so big but i split it up into two and the the book still ended up being over 600 pages i was like oh my god <laughs> like what yeah. what did i do right you've created something beyond yes i get you i get you now when you talk about 
the blue. It's interesting for me because uh, when I've, I, I don't know if you know a little bit about mine. I'm just going to tell you just a brief thing. Um, I've written about 12 books and I have five or six uh, on my desk that are uncompleted. So when I first started writing, um, I found the blurb, mm, it's probably a little harder and probably the reason it's like that for yourself because you just did this first and, and you do have 600 pages. It's kind of hard to generalize this mammoth of, of material in front of us that's like, oh my gosh, this is my baby. This is, and then summarize it within so many words. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I fully understand how, oh, how just, it's not really demeaning, but it's, it seems to be overwhelming. That's what I'll say. It's overwhelming to be able to put right. your words around it. But as a reader, let me ask you this as a reader, because obviously as authors, we're all readers. We're enthused about the art, the craft, the material, the story, the escape from our own realities, or, or am I just speaking for myself? But anyways, um, no, no, you're definitely not. Okay. So as a, a reader, tell me how important is the blurb to you so that you like, Hmm, no, I'll pass. No. Oh my gosh. I have to read this one. How important is it to you as a reader when you, when you go into this, when you're looking at the blurbs to figure out what your next read's going to be? Honestly, I, I don't really take that into account. Um, I, I mostly want to see what other people are saying about it. Um, mm -hmm. which I, I know is probably the wrong way to go about it because I mean, it might be a really good book to me and then it just, there are a lot of people that don't like it, but, um, right. I mean, it, it's not the thing that really draws me in. Um, I mean, there, there could be a, a myriad of different reasons for different books. Uh, it, it just mm -hmm. depends on what it is. Um, I mean, is it a, is it a romance book? Uh, is it a fantasy book? Uh, is it something else? Um, right. I mean, it, it's hard to say because it, it depends on the book. Mm. Right. I get that. For me, um, the biggest thing I love action and, and adventure but from what I get from you, and you can quote me on this wrong, if I'm wrong on this, you're a rebel. <laughs> you like it if someone else is like, oh, this book isn't that great. You like the challenge of maybe Cochrane and finding the goods of books and, that are reviewed in a wrong way. Am I wrong? Um, not necessarily. I mean, I, I try to at least for my reading, which I mean, I'm, I'm in a reading slump right now. Um, but I mean, when I do get into my reading moods, I mean, I just like, okay, what's, what do I already have? And then, oh, what, what is new that I can, you know, go explore and find. And I, I also want to try to help out other indie authors by reading their work and at least leaving them a review, you know, mm -hmm. because, um, I mean, I'm, I'm probably in the same boat that they are where, you know, they're looking for those readers and, um, you know, they're looking for that support and that's more of what I've been trying to do at least recently. Right. I can understand that. So <clears throat> since this is your first, um, there is going to be a sequel, yes? Uh, yes, there will be a sequel. Uh, I mean, there will be multiple sequels. I mean, I, I don't have an end in sight to this, but there will at least be um, at least two more, um, at, at least a fourth, because I do have a fourth almost fully planned. Haven't mm -hmm. started writing it yet. The the second book is ready for editing. Um, it's just, I, oh my gosh, I can't afford it. It just, mm. it, it's so expensive. And I, I feel like I'm dying a little inside because it's like, oh. I, this is the thing that's holding me back. You and make a, uh, it, you, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I'm, I'm in the process in the meantime of writing the third book. And, but, but that's almost done too. And I'm like, uh, I'm falling behind. Right. I, I, you, you touched the nail on the head on something that 
<clears throat> this is why I have a warning label for all my books. <laughs> Cause, and I could be, I'm sure that people look down their noses at me for this and that's fine. Um, for me, I edit and do everything myself. Now, don't get me wrong. I have the most awesome PA ever and she edits, but I am a horrible person when you give me negative on my edits. I'm like, you know what I mean? I, there's two sides of me. I like, I'm easy. Go I like to think that I'm easy going. She might say different, but I like to think that I'm easy going until the end. So I'm like, she don't know me. <laughs> she don't know. Right. <laughs> so, um, I understand perfectly what you're saying. And this is something that I don't think there's enough conversation about. <clears throat> there are people that are very pro editing. Okay, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't have it edited. Please, if anyone's listening, do not take that from what I'm saying. But let's break this down for anyone who doesn't have any common knowledge of writing. Especially as an indie author, the majority of us pay for everything. Everything. Yep. Okay. Um, when I first started out, and you can look me up, guys, Ari Nelson, I'm all over. You can look at my book covers. I was very basic. I learned, I did some online tutorials and classes, got the material, got some equipment, got better with my book covers. I also ran an online magazine in order to do graphics and get better with them through the time. It's just like doing this podcast. This is so that I'm better at audibles because I'm recording audibles and I also want to put myself out there to do other people's books, which is one reason I started this to become more articulate because the more we practice at something again like graphics or whatever writing in general and here we go the editing it is very expensive this is something i tried to tell everyone knew that asked my opinion the main way that you as an author can make a profit at writing now don't get me wrong there are some very successful writers out there but the major the main general of how to make a profit from authoring is find something you can sell to another author. And that's the truth of it. It really is because it takes such a long time. And even every book that you publish for every 99 cents of your book, you probably only make 30 cents for every book that you publish. 30 cents for every 99 cents that you put out there. And it's expensive. Then you go and you put editing into it. Plus, you have to do graphics. You have to do formatting. Let's not get that. <laughs> because yep. ed for a, a paperback has not the same measurements as an as a ebook. Totally different things. And not every ebook is the same measurements. If you're going on a nook, if you're going on oh um, the typical e-reader for uh, Amazon, everything, Kindle, there's my word, Kindle. Yeah. And then <laughs> I, ha I have a uh, Kobo, all of which, all of which different editing formats, unless you are lucky enough to get into a situation where they're going to format it accordingly. But in the very beginning, you could tell because as soon as you would open the book, the digital formations were totally off or totally different. So it took you a while to get all that established. <clears throat> and then meantime, the editing, which, by the way, is probably the most expensive part of writing your book. And then 100%. not to mention. Yes. And people don't understand that. And the bigger the book, <laughs> the more the cost. And then. Mm -hmm. And then if, you, if you're unfortunate to get an editor who doesn't understand your writing style, oh my gosh, then there's a creative difference. Because not only in the sidelines are you going to get, I don't think this character does this. I mean, who's writing this? So there, there is a constant contradiction. So if you don't work hand in hand with your editor, this means having a real relationship with this person, then your book can flop just based on that. So it can flop based on um, editing issues of your own, how you, and I never thought, to be honest with you, when I first did my first book, I never thought that my writing was different until, <laughs> until I started getting edited. And then I was like, holy freaky oi. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. 
So now on my books, I have always said that I am the unorthodox author. Um, I have a complete, um, like a disclaimer for all of my, all of my material, even though, like I said, I work hands in hands with, uh, with my, my personal assistant and she's more than that because like I said, she handles everything from this to that and everything. And also she listens to my drama. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, but if you don't have that connection, I mean, it can, it can just fall and people don't understand that. This is another big reason why I have such an issue when people download for free because it is such an expensive endeavor and people don't understand that writing, it's just like, to me, it's just like painting. Um, every artist has their own perception, even the way words are done. Um, I don't know if you've ever listened to Fry. Um, he's, he's British and he does this, he does this YouTube video and he talks about grammar and how it's perceived and how it's changed and how every perception of an author or writer is different. And in order to open any page, one should enter that realm as you are entering any artistic endeavor. Like as if you're walking into a museum, every piece should be perceived differently. But that's just me. This is, like I said, you, you step on a, a, a small thing there that I'm like, yo, let me wrap myself around that. <laughs> right. I mean, and I mean, that it's just the most frustrating part of the whole process is that it's either, well, I have book one professionally edited, but then mm -hmm. I could make the choice to do editing myself to book two with just the help of alpha readers and beta readers and having them look for things. But then I feel like, is it going to come off as a completely different book, like a mm -hmm. different style, like someone else wrote it if I don't have it professionally edited? Mm -hmm. Because for, I mean, for my, the, the romance manuscripts that I have planned, I mean, I'll probably just do those myself or, you know, see if there's a cheaper option. But um, me, for this series, for Council of Myths, I like, I, I'm either going to have to do a complete 180 or I'm going to have to wait until I can actually afford to have book two professionally edited again. And I want to stick with my same editors because I, I did really enjoy working with them. And mm -hmm. I, I don't want to, you know, be like, well, you know, you guys are too expensive. You know, I'm going to move on, which I mean, I, they would probably understand, but I, I did right. genuinely love working with them. Right. Uh, like I said, there are many people who enter the realm of writing, author, all that. Some perceive it as a business in general, and it is. But I think there's also a very fine line as far as if you're going to do it, make sure you truly love doing it <laughs> because there can be a lot of heartache in it. There can, as far as reviews and putting yourself out there in general, um, you might even run into an editing system that hasn't met the needs of what your book may have, may have needed. So it's, it's really to go in and get your feet wet, but it really is a learning experience. And the only thing I can say, the only good advice I would give anyone who's new starting out is make sure that you truly love it. <laughs> you know, exactly. make sure. It, yeah. And um, also have a career on the back line because, <laughs> you know, there are some really great authors who have hit number one, but it takes a great deal of effort it's not just writing the book the editing even after that you got to look at social media you got to have some stance on that and i have seen just in my own time i've seen some posts and and commentary from other authors that has been career ending so yeah you know what i mean it's 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 very oh it's just 
it's just a lot of work. That's the only way I can say it. It's just a lot of work. Um, it is so I wanna, much work. It is. I want to wish you the best of luck on this. And when you get ready to publish your next one, please come back because I'd love to talk about the next step and how it's evolved for you since your first book. So I'd love to have you back anytime. I want to thank you so much for coming on today, though. Well, thank you for having me. And absolutely, I would love to come back. Awesome. Well, guys, today, I'm well, tonight, I should say, we're a little bit past our interview time, but I've enjoyed really talking to uh, Samantha here. And I know I've gone on and on. My apologies, Samantha, <laughs> if I'm <laughs> overtaking you today. I'm a talker. That's all I can say, guys. But we've come to that small part into the podcast, the last bits of the Amazon of the deal. And I know a lot of you guys really like us. I get a lot of comments on it. Today, I pick something that I, I've I bought before, but I bought the California King. Um, they are sheets, guys. It is the queen size sheets, breathable and cooling hotel luxury bed sheets, extra soft, deep pockets. Get this, they're 36% off. They're down from $39.99 to $25.99. I'll have the link in the bio. And trust me, guys, they're wrinkle free. And if you're like me, thanks, sit in the dryer too freaking long. <laughs> so these are awesome for that. I want to thank you, everyone, for listening tonight. Again, thank you, Samantha, for being with us. You were an absolutely gem to have on. Again, till next time, guys. Bye-bye for now.